Okay, In Defense of Ska will begin in just a moment. But first, I just want to say thank you for listening to the podcast. It means so much to us. And if you enjoy the podcast, tell your friends about it. Um, the best way to do that is to, you know, follow us on Instagram and Twitter and share our posts and let people know when they say, hey, is there a podcast I should be listening to? Say yes, In Defense of Ska. Go on to wherever you get podcasts from and subscribe to the podcast. Leave a five-star review. Let people know that you support In Defense of Ska, that you defend Ska. Thanks. Agent 99, a short-lived but excellent 90s New York ska band, taking a kinetic approach to the genre, but not really mixing over punk or hardcore elements. The group launched the careers of people like Ara Babijan from The Slackers and Alec Bailey from Leftover Crack. But their lead singer, Dunya Best, is a real talent and worth getting to know better. Since Agent 99, she's performed in other bands like Brave New Girl and Dubistry. Currently, she plays in a group with her husband called Dunya and Aram. They just released their debut album, Bedfellows. Today, we talk to Dunya and hear the story of her long and interesting musical career in ska and reggae. Dunya came up in our episode with Ara, right? Yeah. And so she was in Agent 99 with him. Well, it was more like her band, and he was the drummer for that band. Right. Yeah. But I just, I was just trying to illustrate like how small of a world music is. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Agent 99 had Ara in it. This was uh, Dunya's band. Alec Bailey, who would go on to be in Leftover Crack with Ara, was in that band. And then uh, Jason, who is now the guitarist for Slackers with Ara, was also in Agent 99. So it is a um, small world. Yeah. I often feel like there's only actually 100 people in the world (laughs) (laughs) that you interact with on a regular basis, and they just keep cycling through. Yeah. Do you not feel like that? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's 250 people. Oh, it's 250. Okay. Somewhere between 100 and 250. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you were um, you were part of the Rude Girl Review, right? I was. Yeah. What was that process like? Did they like kind of tap you and say, you want to join this project or? Um... Yeah, basically. Um, so I, I understand that Kristen was talking about it with Jenny and uh, then Tara got wind of it, and Tara kept asking about it, and Tara basically just made it happen. Mm. So, um, so yeah, they they buzzed me about it. I think Tara might have asked me, like, if there was going to be an all star women's group, would you join it? And I was like, heck yes. <laughs> I know that there was uh, one uh, rehearsal with everybody. And I am pretty sure there's was one rehearsal where it was the, just the East coast folks. So I assume you were at both those. I was, Oh, actually I was uh, that day. I was also picking up my friend Vivian from the airport. So it was an exciting uh, adventure. The first, the first rehearsal day. What were those rehearsals like? Um, well, the first one was in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and a lot of the rude girls live in uh, Maryland and and South. So uh, I know that there was a van filled with women coming up from Baltimore, and I came up by myself because I was picking up Vivian from the airport that day. You know, uh, Tr- Trisha came down, Trisha from uh, some ska band came down from Rochester even. And we all went went to New Jersey, to New Brunswick, to this little studio with no air conditioning on the first hot day of the year. <laughs> Always fun. <laughs> I mean, it was funny because, like, the thing is, you know, the guy who ran the space is, like, so super sweet and so super nice. So we were, like, grateful to have the space. And he was very kind. And he just had all these, like, uh, portable air conditioners that he did the best he could with. But, you know, you, you're going to fit, like... 10, 11 people in a room, it's just, you know, doing stuff. You're not going to be cool, even if there's like high air conditioning going on. So yeah, <laughs> it was a little, it was a little crowded and sweaty. But the, the other thing was that was cool was that we all walked in and we had an idea of the songs we were going to do and the parts we were going to do roughly. Cause it was, I mean, 
the, everybody's super organized and very professional, which is the, the, the joy of it. And um, so the parts were set up. We knew who was going to sing what on which songs. We had words and music all printed out. And we all got in there still a little unsure of ourselves, which is, you know, we chalk that up to the patriarchy. (laughs) (laughs) You know, because despite everybody having, I mean, literally centuries of education, music education and practice and performance, you know, in this group, like you know, we're still like, ah, oh, I don't know if I can do this. And it's just like, oh my God, of course we can, because we we've all, you know, been doing this. So it was really cool to hear us all together, uh, you know, actually making it work. I wasn't able to go to Supernova, um, because I, I I live in California. It's kind of a trek. Although I would like to go to Supernova sometime. It's a fun show. Yeah. What's the vibe like there? How would you describe it? It is really uh, friendly and it, you, you know, even though people are camping out and stuff and it, it got one year, it got very muddy, you know, but it, 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 there was never any animosity between people anywhere. Everybody's super friendly. It was very like, it almost felt like a, a family vibe, you know, everybody just like, it almost felt like a family reunion type of a vibe. It was very, very relaxed, very chill. So for 2021, the the thing I heard the most about, like leading up to the festival and after, was Rude Girl Review, and um, and, I, and when I saw footage too, I was like, "This is awesome!" I, I really wish I could have seen that. Yeah, we had a great time. What was that like? I mean, there was anticipation, like once it kind of leading into the actual event, people were kind of talking about it, right? And saying, oh, well, this is because it was a special thing. It wasn't a, you know, the 500th time that, you know, I don't know, mustard plug or something played. Right. You know, it was a, a first time thing. So everyone was curious. Yeah, it was. Well, we felt a lot of pressure <laughs> to to perform well. Because we were like, man, what if we did all this lead up and then we just suck? <laughs> like that, that. So I think everybody practiced extra because of that. I think that that really made us want to do well because we didn't want to get up there with all this build up and uh, and and just be bad. Um. That said, I don't I don't think it could have been bad. Everybody is so amazing. Everybody's so skilled and like you know, on their game. It just, I I don't think it could have been bad, but I don't think we knew that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can remember, you know, playing shows feeling, you know, you get a, you get a bigger show and you're all rehearsed and ready to go. And then before you go on stage, just every, every bit of fear just hits your head. Like this is the show where I'm going to completely mess up. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think what happened was when we all got there and we did the rehearsal the night before the show um, and we like, we really heard it with like everybody in there and it, it flowed and, you know, we saw what everybody could really do in person. Like, you know what I mean? It was, it was really nice. And we had a nice vibe in the room and uh, you know, everybody was super supportive of each other. That's really the, I think that's the gist of the Rude Girl Review thing is that it's women supporting women in a in a non patronizing way. Like we we all just like recognize each other's power, and, yeah. and it was it was great. Now there was a song um, Jade Tremba recorded that you were on. Uh, Love the way you. Dub. Oh yeah, yeah yeah yeah. Was this recorded around the same time? Because this was uh, said featuring. Dunya and Rude Girl Review. Yeah, we did it afterwards, actually. And uh, everybody, I think a bunch of people got together in the studio uh, in Maryland, I think. Or maybe it was in New Jersey. I wasn't there for the studio recording. But um, but I heard, I saw them record that and then they sent, sent me uh, the track and was like, this would sound cool with a little chat over it do you think you could manage it i was like i'll give it a shot you know yeah uh, (laughs) yeah it sounds great 
Yeah, I wanted to do something, you know, I wanted to do something in the vibe of the song. And, uh, you know, I, I wanted it also to be like uh, an ode to DJs of all genders. So I didn't, you know what I mean? So that's why I was like, I, you know, I tried to make it about the DJ more than, more than, and like also, you know, when you listen to dub, it does give you like a bubbly feeling inside. So like, you know, I tried to make all of that happen in, in the chat. But it's such a fun song, isn't it? I really enjoy it. Yeah, it's great. So you the you've done a lot of bands, and we're going to cover a lot of your older stuff. But um, what you're currently focusing on is uh, Dunya, Dunya and Aram, right? That's your, you and your husband. Yeah, Dunya and Aram. Yeah. So the you have a new record called Bedfellows. Yes. Tell me a little bit about the project. Um, the songs I've heard and the footage I've seen is seems like tends to be some more stripped down acoustic instruments. Um, I don't know if it's strictly just the two of you uh, on recordings or not, but um, so I've seen footage of just the two of you and it has a cool sound to it. I think um, as much as I like big um, ska and reggae bands that, that have all the instruments, it, there's something that's pretty cool about going the opposite direction and kind of bringing it more down to just being like, just a few. Yeah. Um, well, the the project really started out as, um, you know, it was like, you know, COVID and we were at, you know, at home with our stuff, our equipment. And I started to, you know, record Dunia acoustic music. And I asked Aram to put some bass and guitar on stuff. And, he, and then, and, you know, we liked the sound of it. And we have a friend, Hans Nieswant, who is from Germany, from Cologne, Germany. And he was actually living in South Korea. He's He's been living in South Korea uh, since the, before, just before COVID. And he wasn't doing anything. He's usually a DJ, a, like a disco DJ in Germany. And uh, he wasn't, he wasn't working on anything. And he was like, he, he keeps sending us tracks to work on of his, of his disco tracks. And so Aaron was like, I wonder if Hans would work on this acoustic stuff for us and 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 tune it up for us. Um, and I think the first project was actually, we did something for the Specialized Project. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we I wanted it to sound really good. And we sent it out to Hans to, to you know, nice it up. And we liked the way it sounded. So we, we sent him another one. You know what I mean? We just kept sending him tracks and all of a sudden we had like an album's worth of tracks. The specialized project for anyone that's unaware is, is Paul Wylo. Well, can you tell people about them? Yeah, they it's Paul Aris and Paul Wylo and they are they you know, they have a band called The Scapones and uh they are based in England. They have a a, a project that they do to to raise money for for troubled teens. And uh and so they put out a call for tracks, you know, and and we sent one and they liked it. I think this was the, I can't remember which is, it was the first one that we did. We did The Man Who Sold the World for them. Nice. And, uh, it, you know, I loved the way it sounded with Hans producing it. And uh, so Hans did more for us and he did my, you know, we ha- we have a c- bunch of songs from all of our old bands that we started playing with just Aram and me, you know, just acoustically. Um, we moved from New York down to Maryland because my, you know, my husband's a professor and he got a job uh, teaching at the university down here. So we had to move and we, you know, we couldn't take our whole band with us. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so we started playing duos uh, duo shows and figured maybe we should just put together a, a recording of the duo, you know, and it was going to be a demo. And then we had Hans work on it and it sounded better than a demo. And um, Hans helped us find a label in Cologne that would put out the record. And, uh, you know, it just snowballed. And now we have a record and a record label for the first time ever. And, um, and and they're they like the way we sound, and it doesn't sound like anybody else that I can think of. Yeah, and I, I really dig it. It's mostly Aram and me on the instruments. Hans sometimes brings in an excellent drummer who we got to play with in person in Cologne. 
uh, recently. Oh, that's awesome. And, you know, and also Hans puts on a little percussion and he adds a little DJ noise sometimes. And it's really fun. Yeah. When you do the stripped down acoustic percussion, you know, it, you feel the groove differently than when it's the big band. And I, and it has an interesting groove, I think. Yeah. Like it, it could bounce is a little different. Yeah. I, but what, what I um, try to do, it, I kind of brought it all the way back to the Nyabingi sound in my mind. Mm-hmm. I wanted to make it sound like, you know, the roots of it all, you know? Yeah. Like really bring it, really bring it home. Cause also, you know, I like, I love, you know, punk and I love ska punk and uh, you know, I like a, some of the newer bands and everything, but I also feel like, they there's a little loss of the of the kind of the roots of where the music harkens from Mm -hmm. you know and so i was in i come from like you know i i've been playing african and caribbean percussion my entire life and so i just you know i know how to do that somewhat and so i I threw it in there (laughs) basically (laughs) (laughs) So your um, experience with African percussion predates your time with ska. Oh my God. Yes. Uh, I've been doing it since I was a little kid. My, my mother is a world, you know, worldwide percussionist. Uh, She used to play in a band called women of the Calabash, a group called women of the Calabash. And after that, she played in a group called Lady Gord Sangoma and she's played on records by Nana Vasconcelos. She's, you know, she's played all around the world for heads of states and things like that. So, you know, I, I learned from her. <laughs> What's that like having a musician parent? I mean, and I was obsessed with music as a kid, but my parents could not be less interested in music. So to me, like just music on its own was like, felt like my thing, not like I had my own music and they had theirs. You grew up in a house where music was around. Yeah, very much so. We had instruments everywhere. My father plays trumpet and he sings. And uh, he also, you know, my father's also a filmmaker and a cameraman. He worked for television for my whole life. So, you know, we also met famous musicians a lot. We like met Patti LaBelle and James Brown and all kinds of people. It, it. I mean, what, what's funny about it is I don't know what it's n- like to not have musician parents. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know, we grew up, we went to Dance Africa, we went to Alvin Ailey, we went to, you, you know, we saw all kinds of music all the time. My, my mother has been performing, you, you know, since I was, I don't know, maybe six or seven or eight. And before that, she was in fashion. So I, you know, I was going to fashion shows as a little kid and, you know, I, my whole life is backstage with a coloring book, you know. Was there a point of having your music be something that you identified with and that maybe pushed back against your parents' idea of music or was it never like that for you? It was more about, less about the music, more about the culture, like a set, when I when I started Agent ninety nine and starting started doing that, my parents I don't think I think they, they got <laughs> nervous. <laughs> I, mean, I was hanging out with the, with crust punks and on the you know in Tompkins Square Park and like you know we were hanging out <laughs> with uh, no commercial value and you know Scott and and those crazy people and you, you know it was. I mean, I never, I was never like a drug addict or anything. I had firsthand knowledge that like, I was not about to be a drug addict because like, I just had seen it firsthand too much and it was not cute for me. So I, they, I don't think they were afraid of that, but it was definitely not like the uh, neat and clean, you know, jazz thing that they were much more, you know happy about accustomed to yeah what was the draw of that scene to you i just everybody was really nice (laughs) i just i I always you know i always liked those guys they were very cool and they were free and open and they you know creative and uh 
out, outside of the norm and kind of doing their own thing in their own way. I was always uh, into the yippies and the hippies when I was in high school. I, I was always uh, uh, like a, an activist and those guys were activists and they were going outside of the societal norms. And I appreciated that. So before Age of 99, you were in the first iteration of the Slackers. Yeah. Or well, ish. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> it was a process. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a process. So can you tell us a little bit about that? I, I know you met Vic first, right? In like 89. Yeah. In, uh, at uh, NYU freshman orientation. Yeah. Um, which was, yeah, that was, you know, we hung out and, uh, we met, there was, there was a punk kid that Vic was roommates with that we were hanging out with. And I don't know, we just hung out and talked and, you know, just stayed up all night. And that was fun. There's um, recordings of the very first version of the Slackers. Are, are you on those recordings? Possibly. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> emotions run high sometimes. And, uh, Apparently, there was a bunch of recordings that I was on that Vic er erased. Oh. Uh, so I, I don't know if and where I'm on. The, I mean, you know, this is back when you used two-inch tape, and two-inch tape was expensive. And also, he was mad at me. So, um, you know, I, I don't exactly. I didn't look into it. I'm not going to try to pry or figure it out. You know, mm -hmm. people are young and they do things. Can we ask why why he was mad at you, or do you not want to get into that? You know, I I probably did something terrible. Who knows? I I I I don't remember exactly. You know, I definitely would not go away. <laughs> 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 but it's because, like you know, some of those people are my friends too. You know, I don't just like I never. You know, I I have a, a loyalty to a fault. I mean, how old were you at this point? Uh, 20. Yeah. I mean, everybody's early twenties are pretty chaotic. Young and stupid. <laughs> yeah. My, my early twenties were more chaotic than my teen years. And I probably made dumber decisions in my twenties than my teen years. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, I mean, I don't know. It was, uh, you know, Ira Heaps was the, the engineer and, um, Laura Wexler was with him recording and they, I remember going into the studio and recording with them a bunch of things. And then I, Ira told me that they, that, you know, he got really mad. Vic just like erased a bunch of stuff and, and, uh, you know, you, you know, it, it was probably not a good idea, but at the time it probably was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, I I don't I I didn't get into it. It was not, you know, it's not my business. In Defense of Ska, we'll be right back. Hi, it's Izzy, host of the Intersectional Feminist Music Podcast Sounding Out with Izzy, where I talk with women and queer people in the music industry, from producers to journalists, promoters, and of course, musicians. We discuss the challenges facing people of a marginalized gender in music and the innovative ways my guests are combating these challenges. And at the end of the day, racism exists, sexism exists, homophobia exists, transphobia exists, um, but also solidarity, love and good music exists too. So join us, have a laugh, feel inspired to become a force for good and discover some great new music. Subscribe to Sounding Out with Izzy wherever you get your podcasts. So you, 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 you met Vic, you became friends and when did the band form and, and how did that stuff kind of happen? So I, uh, you know, I didn't see Vic for like a year and I ran into him and happy Michael Weininger on the street. They were selling books on the street and Vic was like, you should come see my band play at the space of chase. And I, and I saw him, uh, hanging out with, with Louis Zuluaga. They were, they were, the thing about it was they were incredibly beatnik and they were dressed in suits and they're sitting on the streets and there's like, you know, Lewis has got bongos and they're playing 
And I just, I, you know, it was just so adorable. How are you going to not, you know, go see that? So I went to go see them at the Space of Chase and they were very good, you know, and, uh, and I was impressed. I was like, wow, this is actually very good. And, you know, and I hung out and I had a, an apartment in Brooklyn, you, you know, and I hung up for a minute and then I, and I left, but then I kept coming back and hanging out. And, uh, one day we were, I guess uh, there were no gigs coming up or something. And it was the whole band walking around. So the whole band at that point was Mark, TJ, Marcus, Lewis, Vic. And we're all walking around, you know, the Lower East Side, just playing music. And we happened upon this like acting troupe or something like that. They had like a space on uh, right across the street from the Mars Bar, which if you know about the Mars Bar, it's like a, the size of a postage stamp. It was the smallest bar in New York. And um, this acting studio was right across the street and they were like, come in, come in and play. And we came in and play and I sang harmony. And Marcus was like, that sounds really good. You know, and, and Marcus, will, Marcus, you know, gets annoyed when I say this, but he, he was like, yeah, she's got to join the band. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, sorry, Marcus, <laughs> you know, and I didn't, I wasn't trying to, you know what I mean? I just couldn't, you know, I can't shut up. Like harmonies, I can't shut up. It's really bad. <laughs> and, um. So I was doing that and then I, you know, I joined in and, and it, you know, it sounded pretty good. I mean, we kept, you know, it kept sounding pretty good. So, you know, it kept it going as long as I wasn't annoying. I mean, there's worse <laughs> problems to have than to be putting harmonies on everything. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and then I could also play guitar a little bit. I could also play percussion a little bit. So I was doing, you know, I was, you know, doing a little, I was making noises that were helpful. Definitely. I don't know if the recordings that exist are with you or not, but they're obviously old. And um, if you listen to um, the early demo called uh, Do the Ska with the Slackers, it's yeah. um, musically not recognizable to the Slackers that we all know now. Yeah, it's true. Vic sounds exactly the same, <laughs> exact same <laughs> voice. It's It's amazing. Yeah, he's never sounded different. He's so young, but he still has that... A tattered voice. I mean, he's he's uh better at smoothing that out now. I noticed it's a little it gets a little croony, more croony these days. Sure, yeah. It's just funny that um, and I, I he's one of my favorite singers. It's funny that so as a I don't know early twenties that he must have sounded like an old <laughs> like an old singer. Just like oh my god, how does this voice coming out of this young man? It must have been <laughs> what it was like to see him in those early days. I mean, the thing is, in New York in those days, it wasn't unusual, really. Mm. You know, oh, we used to have an accent in New York. <laughs> you know, there used to be. I mean, you know, I'm also from the Bronx. You know, we, you know, it, I was. It's just, uh, you know, that's just what people sounded like. So during this time, you were also hanging out with uh, No Commercial Value, which is a St Scott Sturgeon's old band. Yeah, I, w I was a super fan. I love those guys. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they, the songs, they did a song where they, uh, you know, it was in the middle of like Whitney Houston Madness, right? And they took a song and in the middle of it, they're like, you can't take away my dignity. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that is amazing. Like, I just, I love that song. And they were so much fun. And like, we played with them at ABC No Rio. I just, I thought they were so great. This was uh, you as in the Slackers or uh, as Agent 99? Uh, Agent 99, we played with them. Yeah. Okay. But also uh, Sick and Mad might've played with them. What was Sick and Mad? Oh, Sick and Mad was Vic and Happy's punk band. Mm. They, they were great. What was the lineup for that band? Uh, I think it was just Vic and Happy and this guy, Matt, who's the drummer. And uh, and Marcus on the bass. Awesome. Mar it was four. Yeah, Marcus on the bass, Happy singing, Vic on guitar. Although on the recordings, Vic was on bass and guitar. And then Matt was the drummer. And, uh, you know, they were from Westchester. 
and uh, they were great. They were great, like an awesome punk band. I, we actually covered one of their songs for the the Dunia and Aaron project. Covered a Sick and Mad song for uh, the Stubborn Records uh, compilation, the, the latest one. What's that song called? It's uh, called Chuck Authority. Nice. Oh, speaking of uh, Dini and Aram, um, you posted on Facebook, um, a, you know, the, the test pressing. You're listening to the test pressing. And it's just a visual of the of the record spinning. Yeah. What song is that? Because I really dig that song. That song is called "It's Never Easy Sight." It's actually a first single. I'm working on a video. Okay. It's yeah. It's never easy sigh. It's really I I really dig that song and which is we my Aram wrote that song and he wrote it uh God years and years ago actually but the the funny thing is it's you know the name Simon is a recurring name in our lives and our our son's name is Simon and he thought the song was about him but the song actually predates him. That said. Raising a child, it's it's never easy. You know what I'm saying? So. <laughs> it continues to fit. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, was, but yeah, I really like that song. It's really fun, right? Yeah. So how many shows did you play with the Slackers? In Defense of Ska, we'll be right back. Hey, do you like music? Of course you do. Who doesn't like music? And you like humor, right? I know you do. So would it kill you to just listen to the Not Much Podcast? I mean, what else do you got going on? Nothing. Don't think I don't know. I'm sharing a little bit of my love of music, some stories, even a little skit. Yeah, a little skit. Come on. Okay, it's not much, but it's something. And you know what? It's more than you're sharing with me. Why is it always me doing the sharing? In fact, I don't think you should listen to the Not Much Podcast. You don't deserve it. No, no, don't listen to the Not Much Podcast. And definitely don't click on one of the links or, God forbid, subscribe to the podcast. Yeah, this is money well spent. Oh, I don't know. A a bunch. A bunch. I'm really bad at keeping track of dates and numbers and things like that. I played a bunch with the Slackers. Like, there were several shows a week sometimes. We played a bunch. What kind of shows were they playing in those days? I mean, this they weren't particularly known yet, or was there a scene around them? We, I mean, you know, there was a ska scene, you know. We had, it was us and uh, the Insteps, and we were trying to get in with uh, Second Second Step and yeah, all those guys, Bigger Thomas and those guys, but they were like kind of more popular and and you know we tried to get in with the toasters all that stuff and it didn't i don't know what it, we couldn't quite get in there with them for some reason and then we started renting space from Jeff uh you know who was doing Skinner Box and we played a little with them i think we were playing a lot with uh with local kind of funk bands there was a band called the Authority uh which was they were like so famousy you know what i mean they were like <laughs> they they were so fantastic and my brother had a band called uh Cosmic Ghetto we played with them you know we were it, we were kind of more in the uh the the genres were more mixed up then they you could play with a punk band and a funk band and a ska band in the same night and nobody blinked at it you know we all had fun together so yeah we also played with a band called Bushman it was a it was a punk band and you know everybody was throwing punk into their ska and ska into their punk and hardcore into their you know reggae and you know what I mean it was everybody was good at mixing up their stuff so we we played with a lot of different kinds of bands but all small venues like you know they were popular but small like Continental Divide and um, Space of Chase was a big space actually at the time you know but mostly like Lower East Side we would go up to Thirty Third Street that was like the furthest north we'd go. I'm always kind of amazed from that era that, uh, you know, all those genres have kind of persisted, except for funk. You don't really hear about <laughs> funk being like anything that the kids are still playing. Right. The funk is all old people music now, right? It's all like yeah. George Clinton. But like when we were kids, like there was a pretty big funk scene that like, you know, crossed over into ska and metal. Yeah. But you don't really hear that anymore. 
Yeah, it's interesting. Our our time or my time was mostly in the mid '90s, and uh, yeah, the ska scene and the funk scene overlapped to, to the point where I feel like they were to the club owners. I feel like they considered them the same yeah. scene because it was like, oh, we got a funk band. Yes, you can play. Um, right now, in retrospect, they seem a lot more different, but at the time, it was like this is the same genre, according to you know people putting on shows. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it was also, I mean, you know, I don't want to, it's like, all right, I have to get into it. There's also like a racism factor mm -hmm. in there. So like, you know, they, they kept seeing funk as, you know, black people come here with funk. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if you're a total racist, you cut out the funk. It's true. I mean, it's just you know, yeah. fact of, fact of, you know, America. Sure. <laughs> I find that interesting, though, that it would, you know, extend to funk, but not to ska. Well, ska, interest, interesting, you know, interesting thought, right? I mean, uh, if, if you'll notice at some point there, there don't seem to be a lot of black people in ska at some point in the nineties. Mm -hmm. But they're, I mean, they're there, but they're not getting as popular. Right, they're not at the forefront of it. Yep. Yep. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. <laughs> so. Tell me about the found, forming of uh, Agent 99. So, uh, you know, so Agent 99 uh, happened because I started, I wrote a song for the Slackers called Walk, and it was summarily rejected despite it being a very nice song. And uh, then I was summarily rejected. And so I decided to uh, play my songs by myself with a guitar at open mics in various places. and my best friend Gail was like, you know, why don't you just start a band? You can start a band. If your brother can do it, these guys can do it. Why Why don't you just do it? And I was like, all right, fine. And so I went to, I just started asking people if they could play. And uh, I met Jay. I can't even remember where I met Jay now. I think it was maybe at a party. I mean, it's crazy. Anyway, I met Jay and uh, I was like, yeah, somebody tells me you play a guitar. And and uh, he's like, yeah. And he's, I was like, are you good? He's like, yeah. And I was like, all right, well, let's, <laughs> let's, let's see. So, you know, I taught him my, my little tunes and he played them well, you know, better, better than me, which is all that really mattered. And uh, he's like, I know, you, you know, I knew a bass player. I worked with a bass player at uh, Shakespeare and Company Bookstore. So we had him playing bass uh, and we got a drummer that I think was friends with Jay, but like he just, it was not what I needed. And he was like, well, I, I might know this drummer, Ara. And uh, you, you know, he's really good. And I, you know, I, I don't know if he'll play with us, but we could at least give him a shot, you know what I mean? And so, he came, I think we all came over to my house and, it, and uh, Alec, after we played a show, we were called Courageous Cat, Jay and I and uh, the bass player and drummer, we played a show as Courageous Cat with no commercial value. And we were talking about how we needed a bass player and Alec was like, oh, play bass for you. Why not? And I was like, what? Okay, that's great. Cause Alec is amazing. So uh, I was like, but totally, you know. So we, I think we all came to my apartment. I was living by then on Seventy Seventh Street, and uh, we. Alec was like, "Look at this," and he played the bass line for "Sweet Dreams," and I was like, "This is it." We just we played "Sweet Dreams," and it was <laughs> awesome. I was like, "This is it. This is like this is the band." And then they were like, we have to change the name though. Courageous Cat is a little whack. And I was like, oh, I like Courageous Cat. <laughs> and then, but, uh, cause I'm a cat, a crazy cat lady. But um, Jay, Jay came up with Agent 99 as a name and uh, saying it's stuck. It's just kind of perfect. Wait, back up really quick. You're, you're a crazy cat lady. How many cats do you have? <laughs> None right now. I have no cats. My cat passed away and my husband is now allergic to cats. And uh, so, but we do have an awesome dog and a cockatiel. <laughs> that's what we hear in the background? No, that's, I don't know what that is in the background. It might actually be uh, 
It's I think it's a backing up truck. Oh, now I yeah, now I hear backing up truck. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, the Scockatiel, he he's pretty quiet right now actually. But yeah, Scockatiel, Scockatiel TM. Yeah, trademark that That's the band name too. <laughs> But um, yeah, no more cats, unfortunately. We have a cat that visits. It's fine. He's great. My cat passed last year too, so now it's just a uh, oh. dog. Yeah, it's so heartbreaking. I like losing a cat. People, I don't think people understand. We cried for like months. Yeah, yeah. We were like really sad. That cat was like she was everything. Yeah, we had. Well, we actually, the, her sister had passed like a, a year before because we got oh. them together at the same time as little kittens. Oh. And uh, yeah, I know this is a sad story, so sorry, but it's so heartbreaking. But the our the last cat last year we called her Sammy, and um, she had a stroke or something like that, and she couldn't oh. walk. And then we ta- we talked to the vet. The vet's pretty much like, yeah, this is you know you could try. And but she's old and it's not probably not going to get better. Oh, so we had to put her to sleep, and I and I had to take her to the vet and, and I held her while it was, they were putting her to sleep. It was a uh, yeah, it was a very tough day. <laughs> That's so painful. <laughs> it is. I but I, I read I was reading about that and like a lot of people not wanting to do that, not wanting to be there, and like yeah, that, that's saying like it's as hard as it is it is you have you have to do it because for the cat exactly so i was like okay yeah that's what we had to do i know it's a holding oh god it's just i can't even think about it right now actually but it's like you know it's important they need the love as much as you know they, they're they're people yeah yeah <laughs> exactly so anyway so. cat love um, cat, cat love cat. <laughs> Oh yeah, Adam, you have a cat now, right? I do, and and actually, I my, the cat that I had ten years ago, we had to put down, and I didn't even realize it was, it was an option to hold them while they put them down, and I feel have felt bad yeah. about that ever since that I didn't hold them. Oh no! Yeah. Well, he knows though; he's there. He's with yeah. you. Oh, kitty baby. Yeah, Agent Ninety Nine has kind of an interesting sound where you definitely hear a lot of different influences. Mm-hmm. You know, traditional two tone ska is in there, but it's also got other stuff too. So it doesn't necessarily sound like a straight up ska band. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Was there a lot of thought put into it, or was it just like kind of throwing things at it and just seeing what what felt right? My one rule that I kind of brought to everything, which I kind of inherited from Vic and the Slackers, was that we don't pretend to be anything we're not. So mm-hmm. like. I don't try to be Jamaican, you know, I mean, I have a Caribbean family, like I have a Caribbean roots, you you know, my great grandfather's from Barbuda and my grandfather was from St. Thomas, but like we are New Yorkers for generations in my family. So like the the music is New York and Jay is a New Yorker and Alec was a New Yorker and, you know, R is from California. So we just like, we were just ourselves as much as possible in the music, I think. Yeah. And, uh, that was the 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 really the only thing that was consistent about it. Ara was much more into like the Minutemen and that kind of punk influence, and he wanted to bring a lot of like different kinds of grooves to the music. And Alec was really just about like big sound, so that got brought into it, and cool and cool rhythm also. So Ara and Ara and Alec were like a great rhythm section because so intricate you know and so and and they really read each other very well and you know i just i just wanted to be authentic as as authentic to myself as possible so i tried to do as much of that as i could yeah uh, uh, ara I, I think you listened to that episode when we interviewed him yeah it was such a oh, such a good episode i really enjoyed that interview actually he said that he knew nothing about playing ska drums until he joined the slackers in the mid 2000s which i thought was so funny yeah it's totally true. <laughs> it's absolutely true. In fact, we had um we we did a, a little tiny tour through Pennsylvania with the Slackers, is Slackers in ancient ninety nine, and uh, the whole time, Ara was just like, "I'm in the mood for ska," like all super sarcastic <laughs> the whole trip. <laughs> yeah, the first the first time I met Ara outside of a Slackers show, I when I and I was like, "You should come on the show." 
He's like, I'm not really a ska guy. I was like, you're in the slackers. Dude. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. I mean, he plays it. He, I mean, the thing is, Art, a brilliant drummer. That's, you know, but like, yeah, he's, his, his, uh, his soul. He's not really, he's not really a ska guy. Yeah. But that's okay. We we accept the uh, non ska <laughs> people in our scene. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not really a ska guy either. To you know, technically, even though I really dig it and love it and and play it and everything. But you know, my favorite, you know, I'm I like Joni Mitchell, <laughs> and I like mm-hmm. Steely Dan. You know, <laughs> sure. Like Brave New Girl was heavily influenced by both of those. You know, and Sade. Can you talk a little bit about your place in the New York scene because? It seems like it was a little bit different place than maybe you had been in with the slackers. It seems to me like you were, I maybe, maybe I'm not understanding correctly, but it seems a little like you were a little, uh, like played more with punk bands than ska bands and had a, the yeah. fan a little different than maybe slackers era. Well, what, what happened with Agent 99? Well, because we were playing a lot of not ska, not strictly ska music, we, got in with a lot of different kinds of bands. And there was also like a a female music component to it. So we played a big show called the Fierce Pussy Fest in Tompkins Square Park, which I think might have been the first Riot Girl show. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah, if I recall, it might have been. But we and it was all women bands, all women led bands. And uh, Annie Sprinkle was there. It was like a a huge kind of feminist, you know, thing that happened. It was amazing, actually. And we have video from that. Somebody took video of it. It's on online. And uh, it was one of the first Agent 99 shows. Can you recall what other bands played that? Oh, man. Well, uh, Bikini Kill. Nice. Um, there, there were. Oh man, I wish I could remember. I think uh, I can't remember that. There was. I really can't remember the names. I have to go look now. <laughs> Terrible. But it was a long time ago at this point. Sure, sure. You know, that was ninety, uh, ninety blah, ninety three, ninety two, ninety three. Yeah, ninety two. So, oh my God, that's a long time ago. Suddenly. It's funny though because it it, does, it always doesn't feel that way that it is that long ago, but it really is. <laughs> oh my god, it was thirty years ago. I know, Jesus. Okay, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the day after that, there was a meeting for Riot Girls, right? And they're like, "We want to start this thing called Riot Girl, and you know, collection of women, and da 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 da." And I was terrible. Because I was like, but if we're punk rock, why are we joining a club? You mm-hmm. know, is that, that's not punk rock. And uh, so I got cut out of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in there for, I'm in there for a good couple of seconds. You know, enough for my friend who was showing one of the movies to be like, Dania, you're in this Riot Girl movie. I was like, what? Come on, you know. <laughs> and there I am. I was like, oh, yeah, I remember that day. I I was too punk rock for the Riot Girls. Not cool. <laughs> <sighs> and I, uh, you know, I don't know what I would have been had I stuck around and tried to join the club. But I was not about joining any clubs. That's the whole thing. I mean, I was, I, you know, that was part of my punk rock ethic at the time. Yeah. That said, the Fierce Pussy Fest was a fabulous show we had an amazing time and then wigstock was like the next week and you know it was just a very beautiful revolutionary time in the lower east side what was uh wigstock wigstock was like uh it was a gay and transgendered party in the street (laughs) you know it was like you know an homage to stonewall and everybody came out in their best you know uh cross dress and wigs and D light played. And, you know, it was fantastic. It was like, it was a, it was a big party in the street. That sounds great. It was awesome. I mean, I wanted to go every year, but I, I kept having to do something. It's very annoying. So agent 99 is kind of short lived. Yeah. A couple years, maybe. Yeah. A couple years, uh, 90, 
three to 95 is what Jay says, because Jay remembers things better. <laughs> and um, you release something, but after the fact, they kind of put together a sort of a post band release. Yeah, we almost had a record contract. Wh- with, with who? With uh, TVT Records. Really? Can you tell me about that? Well, Alec kind of was making that happen and he came to us and they were going to give us a three record deal for $1,500. And uh, Ara and I kind of thought that wasn't enough money because it wouldn't have even paid for the recording. And we were trying to figure out like if we could get more money to pay for the recording. Yeah. 1500 like 1500 Yeah. <laughs> for three albums? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, what, you know, how are they expecting us to do this? You know, we, we still have to like all have full, full-time jobs and still make a record and still play the gigs. Like it doesn't feel like that would be possible. Yeah. And so we, we rejected that. And then uh, uh, <laughs> things went terribly wrong. I mean, Alec and I think probably Scott got into our rehearsal space and took the instruments and of all the other bands and my best friend, Kathy, whose guitar I was borrowing. I think he didn't know that was mine. And, uh, you know, and you, you got kicked out of the space, you know what I mean? Like, and then I was like, I was like, I'm going to have to find another bass player, man, because my, in my family history, if when somebody starts doing heroin, they don't live very long. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I was like, we're going to have to find another bass player. And then we tried to play shows after that. And I, I, it was, it was, it didn't work out well, but that's how I, I got Aram. Uh, Aram was at a, a party at the Slacker's house because he is friends with Marcus's sister, Catherine, and uh, from, from like college. And Aram was at their house for a val- I guess it was Valentine's party. I don't know. And um, he started playing the bass. And I re- and I actually had met Aram in high school, and I recognized him. And I was like, "Hey, you! I know you." And then he starts playing the bass, and I was like, "Well, it's a bass player that I know. Like, what's better than that, right?" So I was like, "Come down and and play the bass for us, you know, and see if you you know see if it'll work." But Ara was kind of done with it at that point, and. Uh, like really, we we didn't get it. We played one show with Aram at the uh, Continental, and then that was that was that. And it just kind of fizzled at the end. It's not there wasn't a big blowout. It was sad. It was hard. It was no. It was no blowout. It was just like you know, everybody ignoring me. <laughs> <laughs> it's when when you're young, when you're young and in a band, and you have ambitions, and you start to get some momentum. If you lose that momentum, it feels debilitating. Yeah. Especially when you're when you're when you're in that state of mind where you're like, I want to make this thing happen and I want to prioritize yeah. it and you get those setbacks. I think it's pretty tough to like recover from that. Yeah, and and really what I wanted to do is I wanted to take Aram and like I was like, "Hey, you play, I play. Let's just take off." And, you know, we'll we'll play our way through Europe or whatever it takes, you know what I mean? And uh, he was kind of more on a sensible track at that point. He's like, no, let's get jobs like like regular people. <laughs> I tried I tried for, you know, literal decades to be regular people. And it turns out I'm not very good at it. So here I am again. What, what sort of jobs did you have? What was your worst job? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, well, the worst job was... Uh, Actually, I tried to be uh, like a data entry person. That was that was not possible. Oh, worse. But my uh, my coolest job was I actually worked at World Music Institute, uh, where I was ter- I was terrible at it, but it was a really cool place to work. And what, what were you doing there? Just teaching music, or no, no, as a box office manager. Okay. You know, I've taught music, but I don't think that is one of my greatest skills. Yeah. Teaching music. I I don't know if I'm able to impart music in a way that makes sense to other people's brains. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've had the same experience trying to teach guitar. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've tried lots of different approaches. I've had very minimal success. 
<laughs> and I, I just think it's be exactly what you said. It's it's trying to impart what how you see it in your brain to how somebody else is going to see it, and everybody's brain is different. And I'm like, there's a spatial relationship between, and that then they're lost. Yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can teach yoga. Yoga, I can teach. Oh, nice. But uh, but other stuff, not so much. Isn't data entry just the most soul crushing thing you can do with your time though? Oh my God. <laughs> Weeping. Like you would think that somebody was stabbing me again and again and again the way I was weeping over this job. <laughs> weeping openly. Yeah. I was like, but the money, think about the money. <laughs> <laughs> I I had a data data entry job where um I really tried to apply myself to it for like a full day because they were like how, how much, you know, they were like, this is the amount you should be able to get through in one day. So I was like, okay. And I like worked through my breaks and like, I still came up like way short. Sure. <laughs> and so after that, I was just like, forget it. Right. So I just started coasting and it was like, it was only a temp job, but it was like right before like a European tour, right before a European tour. And, uh, oh my God. And so I needed the money. And then the, <laughs> the bosses pulled me into the office and they were like, we're going to let you go. And this is why. And I, oh. I just let it wash over me. I just didn't even care. But I went back to my desk and I just took the whole folder on the desktop of all the entries that I'd done. Uh-huh. And I just deleted it. <laughs> and, and <walked> out. <laughs> That's awesome. It was the best feeling. <laughs> like all the work gone. <laughs> Take that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the best personification of that was on TV? It was um, on Broad City. Do you, do you ever watch that show, Broad City? Oh, yeah. It's so yeah. funny. A bit, yeah. Well, Alana's character is like in the bathroom basically the whole time just smoking weed. <laughs> I, I just thought like that's a data entry job. That's how that's the only way one can approach it. Like how else are you going to do that kind of job? Have you seen that uh, newish show on Apple called Severance? I've started watching that. Oh my god, it's crazy! It's a little depressing, though, eh? They, yeah, they obviously they chose data entry because that's the most soul crushing, nightmarish job that you can have where you can never leave. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you just have to delete it from your your daily life in order to function. Because if you think about it too much, oh my god, yeah. And just really quick, one last thing on on this subject. How long ago was this job? <laughs> now that's the funny part. Um, it was only uh, it was only a few years ago. It was like uh, okay, maybe nine years ago. I tried to do it. Yeah. So for me, it was twenty at this point. <laughs> do you still have stress dreams about it? No. Oh, thank the gods. Lucky. You're so lucky. I do. <laughs> oh my god. I have dreams that I'm back in there doing it. Oh the worst that's terrible yeah no once i realized how terrible i was at it and i just accepted that reality in myself it's like it's not a (laughs) it's not a failing it's not because you're stupid you know what i mean like it's because it's it's your brain will not do that for you your brain will not allow you to do that and like and i i felt really bad crying over it because like there are people out here like would love to have that gig you know what i mean and I'm like, well, let them have that gig. But the the thing that really hurt me is that the things that I'm good at don't get paid very well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's the that's the real problem. And and uh, I I chalk that up to a societal problem, and that's how I'll uh, reconcile that. Yes. So do do you turn ter- currently teach yoga? I do once in a while. I ha- I haven't had a steady yoga teaching gig in a little while, but uh, I I would like to. I teach group fitness also. All right. Um, <laughs> you can't. You can't make a living doing it. <laughs> no, you cannot. You cannot. Yeah. I know. I'm like part of me wants to go for the like extra teacher training thing so I can get my like, big 500 hour teaching training thing, and then I'm like, but how do I justify doing that like financially? Yeah. And that's so I just don't. I keep looking at it, going, man, I would love to. Dig, or even Ayurveda, I've been gotten into Ayurveda recently, which is really cool, like me- medicinal stuff and body, you know, toning and things like that. And, uh, mm. but I just can't justify classes. So I just, I have tons and tons of books. 
<laughs> and I just I just keep reading all the books over and over again. I've like committed all this stuff to memory. Like I can cure all these ailments that come up and you know, I haven't I haven't been able to like justify getting a de- degree or certificate in any of this stuff. Yeah. It's terrible. That's that's that I'll I'll chalk that up to society too. Yeah. So so your post uh Agent 99 bands are primarily you and Aram, correct? Um Brave Brave New Girl or no, am I Dubistry? Well, it's m- me and Aram and uh Todd Nocera. Okay. Who is brilliant uh amazing keyboardist uh arranger you know person he he was the person that made brave new girl really happen uh, and 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 dubistry to some extent dubistry we started because we moved to los angeles and we needed a new band to play with because it's an addiction and uh, sure mm-hmm. matt urbania who used to play with no shadow kick with Noah Shackman, actually. So Noah introduced us to Matt in LA because that Matt had just moved to LA and needed a project. And Matt is an incredible guitar player. And uh, so we had kind of a drum and bass, dub and bass sound thing. And my brother Ahmed was playing the drums initially. And then uh, we we had a percussionist, we had a DJ and uh, we were playing really, it was very cool. We met Jason Lawless in LA. That way he got us our first bunch of oh, gigs. Yeah. And that's how we got onto that uh, that compilation he put together, the really nice uh, acoustic compilation with Roll Away. We basically recorded Roll Away for him to, to put on that compilation. Then we all moved back to New York and Todd was still there. And so we kind of reformed Brave New Girl with Todd. And then I kind of wanted to play different kinds of gigs. So we kind of had Dubistry slash Brave New Girl. So it's all the same people, but just kind of different groups. And, uh, you know, kept that going as long as we could. Can you talk a little bit about the um, influences and elements in these bands? Yeah, Brave New Girl started uh, because we all loved jazz and we all loved reggae and ska and we all loved kind of grooves and and funk music and i was thinking of it as kind of like a sade meets steely dan meets the selector in my mind i think that's where i was thinking of it and we actually you know we did do some ska you know, because I, because those are the people I knew who could get us, uh, you know, get us play on the radio and stuff. I was trying to kind of use my networks, <laughs> and um, but but the sounds that we came up with were were kind of deeper and more interesting. And when we wrote songs together, it's like pure magic. We would just, you know, come up with jams. Like my favorite song that we have is called one of these days and we have two versions of it that sound totally different from each other but both of them are are really incredible and beautiful uh pieces so um yeah i mean the the one band that we all have in common that we will all have like go to a show is steely dan and (laughs) And not, it's like, it, it's funny. I feel like it's like we hear something in Steely Dan that other people don't hear because people think of it as like smooth music. And I'm, I, we mm-hmm. actually, we were driving from a recording session and we actually got pulled over for speeding listening to Steely Dan because <laughs> we were grooving so hard. I mean, it was just like, it's just so funky. Like the, the drumming is so good, Yeah, you know? And I'm very particular about drummers. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> <laughs> Steely Dan, um, lyrically, I have like such a bite to their lyrics. Totally. I think that it's not a contrast to the music. I think it's a more subtle bite in the music that matches the lyrics. Exactly. You know, people my age grew up hearing Steely Dan in the grocery store. That might be partly why it's conditioned to be thought of that way. Maybe that's what it is. Because like that... Because that year that they won the Grammy for Two Against Nature, they were like, I'd like to thank Eminem for taking all the flack 
because they literally <laughs> have a pedophilia song on that record. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like it's like not safe for work, you know? It's like seriously, they're writing they're writing really like a, like not entirely, you know, PC subjects, the Steely Dan. Yeah, I mean their name. <laughs> their name is not right? PC. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know? So, you know, I I like how everybody thinks that they're all like nice and smooth, but like they're talking about like affairs and you know yeah difficult difficult adult subjects so the uh dubistry though had some different elements to it you were saying yeah dubistry we took so matt is really good at doing live uh like dubbing out he's 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 just incredible at it so we you know we just took his skill and and capitalized on it you know like he he it was really kind of almost about all about matt dubistry uh because he could do all that stuff live and and um you know aram holding down the the good bass lines and and matt just being like making making incredible noises in person i see you know i really it was really fun and plus, you know, if we could do break beats along with it, it was also fun to like dance to, and you know, it was it was really fun. I saw something you said, like I think it's on your Twitter or something. It says Dub Yoga. Yeah. Is Dub Yoga? Can you say what Dub Yoga is? Dub Yoga really is just my um, it, I'm it, it's it's more of a concept. I haven't really done anything with it. There is mm. somebody who did do something that isn't me, but they made it two words. Mine is just one. I, I, I just bought it before everybody else did. Um, <laughs> Smart. Thinking. Yeah, but I have a whole, uh, I have a whole, it, it, it's a concept that I have yet to flesh out, but I'm about to flesh out. It's, it's has to do with kind of seed sounds and seed rhythm mm-hmm. and uh, like r- roots of music and movement, basically things like that. Interesting. I look forward to, hearing more about that as it evolves. Yeah. 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 I, I have a DVD that's a black metal yoga. Yes. <laughs> I love that. I've done, I've done that before. Yeah. I have a friend who, one of my friends who I was in teacher training with actually has a, a, a black metal ballet troupe called a oh, wow. ballet Mori. I think it was. They, they are fantastic. Mm. Fantastic. All metal, all different kinds of metal from all around the world. Fantastic. In Defense of Ska, we'll be right back. Hey, Ryan, quick question. Do you think country music and rap music can ever coexist? I don't know, man. Do you think I have what it takes to be a pop star? Yeah. Did Weird Al save rock and roll? Maybe. Did Slipknot invent violence? Wait, 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 wait. Do you like jazz? For the answers to these totally random questions and probably hundreds more, join your new best friends, me, Ryan Wallace, and me, Zachary Wilson, every Monday on our show, From do Up to Death Metal. Find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever your hipsters find your podcasts. Those darn hipsters. So, you got to work with Ari Up from The Slits? Yeah, well, mostly we were just friends. <laughs> yeah, I would, I'd love to hear about that. Uh, I love the slits so much. Yeah, I, um, I I wish people. I mean, you know, there are definitely slits fans out there, but I think the record they put out was is one of the best of the era, and it like yeah, it encamp it encapsulates reggae drumming with post punk sounds in a very exactly. interesting and, and unique way that you know. Anyways, I just think it's a brilliant, um, brilliant work that they did. So I- I'm curious how you got to be friends with her and, and your story with her. Well, um, actually, I met her uh, through the Slackers. You know, um, I met her at Wetlands. Uh, Mark was like, come here, you have to meet Ari Up. And I was like, oh, dip. So we met Ari Up and uh we basically ended up, this is how all my good friendships start. We ended up just staying up all night and talking. 
you know, yeah. <laughs> like much later than we, much later than we expected. And we just kept hanging out. Um, you know, she would come over and we would have make dinner and just talk and talk and talk. And we talked about politics. We talked about music, you know, talked about like life and kids and things like that. Cause she had her sons, uh, they were living in LA and we hadn't had any kids yet, but you know, I was, you know, she's just cool. She was, it was a game recognized game moment. I think, I think we recognized each other's crazy. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> When we moved to LA, she was like, listen, when you move to LA, you have to call me up and, you know, hang out and, you know, come visit. And so we, you know, we moved to LA and we hung out at uh, Johnny Rotten's house in his hot tub. And uh, (laughs) (laughs) what was that like? It was fun, man. We just, I mean, they weren't there at the time. So it was even more fun. (laughs) So you just got to use it. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. We got to use it. You know, we, I had to borrow some swimming trunks. You know, it was like, it was cool. You know, we hung out at the at the house and um, hung out with Nora a little bit and hung out with the boys a lot. You know, Wilton was around, uh, came around our house. And when we had our son, Wilton played with our son. You know, we, we just, we were, you know, it was very much like, like a family hangout almost all the time. You know, it wasn't anything you know, particularly, you know, exceptional, I, I accept that, except for the people, you know, mm-hmm. we, we didn't, we weren't like, you know, drinking and throwing shit, you know, like it was never anything like that. It was always <laughs> like, let's cook some dinner and we'll listen to some music and maybe we'll write some stuff, you know? Yeah. And, you know, or like, you know, Ari, when we moved back to New York, Ari came over and she was like, listen, you have to watch, uh, the uh, the not the voice show is the first one American Idol. You have to watch American Idol with Ellen DeGeneres because she's really interesting on the show. You have to see how she does this. And I was <laughs> like, okay, like the only person in the world who could get us to watch American Idol is Ari up, you know. Yeah. So like, and uh, and we did, and she was like, it was interesting what Ellen was doing because she was not willing to pit people against each other. You know what I mean? She was being, she was, everybody was friends. That was like her bottom line, which I found very interesting, you know? And, uh, you know, she gave me a book about, you know, we talked about politics a lot. She was really pro Hillary before everybody else. And, uh, you know, we were like, but Barack Obama, she's like Hillary Clinton. Okay. And we were like, all right, all right, whatever you say. (laughs) You know, and we would like, we hung out on Halloween and stuff. I don't know. We just did a lot of kind of family stuff together. She was there for my, uh, the birth of my second child. You know what I mean? <laughs> We're really like, wow. it was really just family. Wait, was she there like midwifing? Not exactly. She was going to come over anyway. And it was like the week okay. I was supposed to give birth and she's going to come over anyway. And I was like, I'm not going to tell her to not come over, but I might be in labor, but I might not be. I don't know. And I, and I was in labor and, you know, she cooked me up some Jamaican food and, uh, you know, (laughs) my, uh, my doula actually uh, had a, had an emergency and couldn't make it. So it was a good thing Ari was there. Yeah. My doula was late and my husband was working, uh, Aaron was working a terrible job um, at that point and they wouldn't let him out. Oh, geez. Immediately. So it took him a while to get home. So it was a good thing Ari was there to like help me out. And not like I was in deep meditation, you know, and then we like <laughs> mm-hmm. zipped over to the hospital and Ari hated hospitals. So she, she broke out as quickly as she could, but like, uh, you know, she was there, you know, my, my baby had wow. a punk rock birth. <laughs> <laughs> And when she came out, you know, it actually, her her vocal, you know, when she was born was pretty spectacular. So that that first that first cry. Oh yeah, it was good. Good noise. Yeah. When uh, Mark Wasserman interviewed you some years back, yeah. um, you said that Ari influenced you or inspired you to speak your mind. Uh, I'd like to know more about that. Ar- yeah, I mean, Ari was never afraid to be Ari. Never let anybody stop her from being that, you know, people kept trying to get in her way and she wouldn't let that happen. And it's, 
you know, being around somebody like that, why would you hold yourself back? You know, that it's, it's very inspiring. I love watching music documentaries and, but you never know when you watch a music do- documentary of a band you like, if you're going to end up liking them a little less or a little mm. more, you know, not nothing bad. Like, Oh, I can't listen to this music anymore. But sometimes you, you, you see the person behind the music and they're kind of a, cranky or uh unlikable person and you're kind of like oh that sucks yeah. but um yeah. when i watch when i watched the slits documentary i um definitely it grew a, a greater appreciation of her and liked her a lot more than i already did from before yeah. when i just, just was sitting with the music itself she was a interesting person with a lot of energy and, and a lot of conviction yeah definitely always always as true as possible to herself. When you say that she inspired you to speak your mind, is there any example that you feel like in your own life where you felt like I am, you know, I'm, I'm more comfortable speaking my mind now or, you know, anything like that? I mean, I think in general, I think I, I have, I like, I I used to filter myself a lot more, I think, Mm -hmm. you know, I used to care a lot more what other people thought about me, you know, and the other, you know, the other thing, like, you know, I just turned 50 and Ari died at 48. You know what I mean? And yeah. life life is short, you know, there's no time. You never know what's going to happen. There's no time to, to limit yourself, you know? So, you know, she as a, as a parent, as a, you know, a woman, as a performer, you know, there's just no time to be anything but yourself. Yeah, that's that is definitely true, and I feel that more as as I get older. I'm 46 now, and it's uh yeah, it kind of hits you more and more each year that you're on this earth. That yeah, time's limited, and mm-hmm. a lot of this stuff doesn't matter. That a lot of the stuff that feels like it matters doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. When I was 46, I had a I had a heart attack even. So like oh wow, Oof. you know, and that was. Not, I mean, it wasn't it. The best part about it was that there was like, they were like, oh, you obviously have some blockage or something. There must be something, da da da. da. And there wasn't, you know, there was no, nothing for them to remove. There was no thing for them to like work on, which means to me, in my mind, I was like, well, this was brought on by myself. You know what I mean? Like, what have I been limiting myself in? And I kind of made a phase shift at that point as well. What big shifts did you make? Well, you know, I uh, carried around a good deal of anger, <laughs> shockingly. Mm. And um, <laughs> uh, so I had to, I had to let that shit go. You know, I had to be like, I'm sitting, I'm sitting here fuming and, and furious because, uh, you, you know, people I thought cared about me ignored me. You know, and I'm like, what, you know, so I'm avoiding them. What's that getting me? A heart attack. So I'm not going to avoid them anymore, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to try to be more open and, you know, and receptive and truthful to myself, you know, and I had to, that's when I, you know, started, you know, teaching myself how to accompany myself on various instruments. Cause I, I, I always waited for somebody who was just better than me to accompany me. And I was like, you know, I can't wait anymore. I have things I have to say, you know? Yeah. You know, when you, when your when your hospital stay feels like a spa vacation, it's time to take stock. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. So you've played some shows with uh, Dunya and Aram. Is uh, are we going to be seeing more of that? Yes, uh, we're actually do- we're doing a few shows this summer in support of the album, mm-hmm. um, and we're trying to. We we were just in Europe. We played in Cologne for the our record company, which is located in Cologne, and uh, we're working on some hopefully some West Coast stuff this fall. Oh, you definitely have to let us know if you come up to Northern California. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, the Dunia and Aram show. We we definitely want to come. We're going to be spending some time in um, British Columbia, so cool. we'll be a little closer, uh, you know, for that kind of thing. I really hope we can come to Northern California. 
if you have ideas of places to play, please let me know. Sure. And uh, <laughs> cause I, I, I realize also that I, I'm, I'm terrible at booking shows so I get really shy and embarrassed, which is another thing I've been working on. They, I, I definitely want to do that. I want to get down to San Diego with the uh, smoke and mirrors guys. And uh, you know, I just kind of want to do more of the going on the road thing because I really enjoy it. Thank you so much for listening to In Defense of Ska. If you've enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you normally stream or download episodes. If you haven't already, Grab a copy of my book, In Defense of Ska, available at clashbooks.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. It's at In Defense of Ska. And please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com backslash In Defense of Ska. You will get monthly bonus episodes, extended interviews and commentary per episode, and access to the In Defense of Ska Discord. In Defense of Ska would not be possible without the great team that tirelessly works on it every week. So you should go check out their other projects as well. Co-host Adam Davis has an amazing band called Omnigon. Give them a follow on Instagram and Twitter. It's simply at Omnigon. And our editor, Chris Reeves, has a phenomenal record label and podcast called Ska Punk International. For more information, go to skapunkinternational.com. And if you've ever enjoyed one of the highly specific in defense of ska memes floating around the interwebs, it was likely the work of the bands I like only charge $18. Find them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And on that note, we leave you by saying ska now more than ever. Okay, you're still here. After the sign-off, you want more, we have more. Over on our Patreon, we have so much bonus content. Listen, if you're looking for more in defense of Ska, if you're looking for some behind-the-scenes moments, if you're looking for just Aaron and I talking to each other, for only $5 a month, you can get that. So why don't you head over to our Patreon and subscribe? We really appreciate it. Thanks.